Institute for Faith and Freedom at Grove City College presents Liberty Mail with the Student Fellows of Faith and Freedom. Welcome back to Liberty Mail with Libby Krieger and Aaron Jenks. And we are coming to you not again from the underground studio, but instead here at Orlando, Florida. Uh, we're here for CPAC still, and this is going to be posted in a couple days after we're making this episode. So CPAC is not quite done yet, but we do have some analysis that we wanted to go over and some of our general thoughts about uh, CPAC so far. So Aaron, what are some of your general um, thoughts on the event so far? Yeah, so a quick takeaway, and I want to kind of plug like, okay, we're here because we are student fellows with the Institute. Mm -hmm. So any Grove City listeners that if you're rising uh, junior or rising senior, please look into uh, the Institute, reach out to one of us. You can do exactly what we're doing. It's a great way to kind of like take your own initiative mm -hmm. and come to great events like this where you can network the heck out of the event, listen to awesome speakers. And if that's not your thing, we also have research mm -hmm. student fellowships. Um, we have several research fellows with different professors and marketing I've preferred personally just because, well, I guess I haven't done the research, so I can't say I prefer it, but I like mm -hmm. the marketing side because you can make it so much of just what you want to do, um, pitch different ideas. Like we got to start this podcast uh, and then someone else, another fellow is doing a children's color book but making it uh, with a political bend so uh, it's just really really cool to be able to help further your career in your specific ways that you want yeah and management throughout the Institute is super supportive mm -hmm. uh, if you think if you're passionate about your ideas and you're passionate about kind of making a change the the people that we work for are definitely gonna back you and want to help you do it yeah shout out to Rob Brenda and Doug mm -hmm. for that <laughs> and dr. Paul Kangor exactly and so moving more towards how CPAC has been mm -hmm. rather than just us being here um, my favorite thing so far is that, so through us coming, we want to have uh, survey data. Mm -hmm. And so we've been going up to just random people throughout the event. And yesterday was awesome. I got to talk to two senators. One was from uh, Maryland and the other one was from North Dakota. And I didn't even know they were senators when I walked up to them, but, yeah. or they're state senators, but mm -hmm. um, great very conversations. Yeah. yeah, very approachable. Just It's a great way to just network mm -hmm. constantly. It's also, like, side note, Aaron is really good at approaching <laughs> people. For some reason, every time I go up to people, I get shot down to take this survey, but Aaron must just be very nice and go up to them, and they always say yes. So <laughs> I got turned down a couple of times, but it's... <laughs> I like it. It's so fun to just have, I just like striking up ran, random conversations. Yeah. No, that's great. But, um, so we'll have more of that data um, soon. We're not mm. fully done with collecting that, but we do have some indicators so far. So we'll talk about some of those questions in a little bit. But yeah. overall. Hey, can you tell them about like the organizations that they have this area where there's tons of nonprofits, mm -hmm. um, just organizations in D.C. that are political think tanks and yeah. you can walk around. So tell us CPAC a little about that. CPAC Central is where all of these organizations have booths and there's people working them, trying to get interns get employees and just spread word about their uh, whatever they offer at their organization there's America's Future Foundation I saw and they have a ton of different networking events in DC Leadership Institute had a job fair they had career consultations um, Concerned Women for America was there and so many more there were libertarian conservative um, basically as big of a tent of conservatism as you can think there's a group that mm -hmm. represents that um, in CPAC Central. So yeah. it's really cool to be able to walk around and so they have free stuff that you can take too. So of course, <laughs> whenever of you're stuff. walking around so long, you got to grab something from each booth. And to further that, it's a huge tent, large in, in uh, width, is that you have every age range. Mm -hmm. You have a ton of 18 to 30-year-olds mm -hmm. and then you have... Uh, Millennials, I guess, in the, in the 30 range. You yeah. have older parents. You have like people that your grandparents age. Some boomers. And like so, uh, basically every generation. Mm -hmm. And so is you there. you can talk to anyone that you want to. You mm -hmm. Can uh, I was talking to a ton of just fellow college students that I was very surprised that they were coming. They were traveling from California, mm -hmm. um, Texas. So it was awesome to get that yeah. and just to be able to network with them. It's funny seeing the influencer crowd too. There's certainly <laughs> yeah. like a whole section that you can you can just look at them and you're like, oh, they're they're a conservative influencer. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think that's a relatively new thing that we've seen in the past 10 years maybe of that really coming about as a way of like PR and marketing and everything like that. So that's just another kind of insight into what CPAC actually looks like. Mm -hmm. And people are so receptive to wanting to talk about pressing issues within the mm -hmm. conservatism whether it's uh, the future of conservatism, uh, policy debates, uh, where the party or where the thought will go in mm -hmm. the future, like I said. And it's just awesome to have these conversations with the people. Yeah, because one of our survey questions talks about whether uh, former President Donald Trump is a good 
definition so, of, or so good the, the question reads Trump represents represents conservatism. Yeah. So I guess I was surprised, or not surprised, but it was a big insight for me to be able to see how much uh, Trump still dominates CPAC mm. and still people there are very much. Um, wanting Trump. And I mean, he's speaking tonight, so everyone's really excited to hear that. But I think it would have been really cool to have had seen uh, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. We got here a little bit too late to have seen his speech, but from what I heard, he really got the, the crowd going too. And so it'd be interesting to compare and contrast because I know lots of times the media has put those two together or mm. um, just compared them in some other ways. So it would have been interesting for us to be able to have seen that, but uh, we'll be able to see President Trump tonight. Yeah, it definitely is. Uh, surprising that I didn't wasn't expecting uh, so heavy like Trump population pro Trump. Mm -hmm. um, the other kind of surprising take that I had was when we're sitting in these large areas. Um, I don't know what to call the main area. The main stage. Yeah, the main stage. Listening to speakers, it, each speaker speaker does such a play on emotions, whether that be fear, joy, mm -hmm. uh, happiness, and like they they want this. They want they like play the crowd. Yeah, yeah. It, it's so much rhetoric towards. Oh, okay, we want booze if we say this specific name, mm -hmm. or we want like a hurrah when we when we state this. And so yeah. it seemed to me that a lot of the speakers like were hitting talking points, mm -hmm. and I, I guess it, it surprised me so much because I thought it would be uh, a lot more like developed dialogue mm. that speakers would like come a panel in. Yeah, almost. almost like speakers would come in and like, okay, I'm passionate about this issue, mm -hmm. but it, it didn't seem like that. It was more of I'm running in this area, um, I'm involved yeah. with this, please support me. Mm. And kind of getting their name out there. Yeah, I guess, I think that's mostly due to the fact of public speaking, kind of like have to have the crowd mm. engagement, otherwise it's boring and then people won't, you won't get invited back. And some of the, the politics of that and just the yeah. reality of having a public speaking situation in front of such a large audience, you kind of have to be able to play on the emotions. But I do understand what you're saying. A lot of it seems so much of like just the conservative mm -hmm. talking points that are we really getting any new information or yeah. are we just hearing, are we just in an echo chamber? Yeah, are we, are we moving forward is my kind of constant thought as I'm listening to the crowd kind of sway either mm -hmm. way. I'm like, okay, are we going to make some positive change or are we just going to kind of, like you said, echo chamber, we bounce off each other yeah. and we, we understand each other's points of view. So do we really need to constantly refer to our point of view? Yeah. Um, I know we, do you want to hop right into the survey questions? Yeah, let's, you want to read one of those? Because the first one, like you said, bring in and how you're surprised about Trump is mm -hmm. with, uh, so popular within CPAC so far this year. And it's that Trump represents conservatism. So mm -hmm. on the survey we had a zero was you totally disagreed with that. And then a 10 was a totally uh, agree with that. Yeah. Our, do you want us to do our takes on that? Yeah, let's do, let's see what, what we. I think I would, I'd put it around a five or a six. I think it's hard. Um, I think he does represent some parts of conservatism. And I mean, the movement right now is very Trumpian, mm. um, very populist in a lot of ways. But I don't think he necessarily represents the true form of conservatism. Um, at its at its best, so I think he has obviously a lot of good qualities, but I'm not sure if if I would say a total ten on that, yeah. and that's why I would put myself around the five and six area. Yeah, I understand your sentiment, and like for me, I see two contrasting views. It's like okay, we come from a very academic world so mm -hmm. far, and our understanding of conservatism, and then okay, now we have real world uh, application of conservatism, mm -hmm. and how does that fit in with the voting block? How does that fit in with the candidates at these events? Mm -hmm. And so when I hear the phrase Trump represents conservatism, my initial kind of more academic leaning background right now is no, mm -hmm. and so I, I think I put like a, a zero just because like. I, with that statement in itself, I disagree. But then part of me, like you said, which makes me want to put more towards like a five or in the middle of the road is that, okay, this is a large mm -hmm. uh, representation of, of what kind of people who identify as conservatives say they are right now. Yeah, I would say and that he represents some principles of conservatism, but mm -hmm. then others not. I don't think he maybe represents prudence mm -hmm. um, in a way that someone like Ronald Reagan did. But I think he's also very pro, pro-life president. Um, he was the first to speak at the March for Life. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I would... I would give him some slack on those areas. Um, so I think it is a mixed mixed bag, but I'd give him a five or six. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what, what people at CPAC say, though, because there is such a a Trump representation mm -hmm. there. I think it's going to kind of represent just like our kind of back and forth is like mm -hmm. we understand that Trump has both done great things for conservatism mm -hmm. and uh, he's represented certain aspects, but then he's failed on multiple aspects. Yeah. And so I think that's going to reflect in the respondents going throughout CPAC is, okay, we'll have some people that are 
very uh, anti, no, Trump mm -hmm. is not conservatism, because they hold on to beliefs that might be more academic and then more like the populace is like, oh, no, Trump is fully represented. Mm -hmm representative yeah. of uh, conservatism. I think it'd be hard to find a politician who is a 10, though, on mm -hmm. representing conservatism anymore. Yeah. So besides someone like Ronald Reagan, I don't know if we've seen that yeah. in recent years. Maybe think, one or two senators here and there, but... I think that more reflects just, like, conservatism is such a... It doesn't have a, a single definition right now. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't have uh, groups... Or we don't have a single understanding of yeah. the definition. Um, oh, I wish I remembered what the convention was in the 80s, but certain, like, conservatives came out and would... Put out the a Sharon document. Statement? Yes, the Sharon statement. Put out a document and say, okay, this is what conservative mm -hmm. stands for. This is what we believe. This is our stance on certain policies. And so maybe that's up to us in mm -hmm. our lifetime to get that message out there. Yeah. So what was the next question that you wanted to go over? So I know there was one about. Um, the next one is uh, President Biden made my liberal friends more receptive to conservatism. And so. Yeah, do you want to start on that one? I got to think about that. Yeah. I know it's made my more moderate friends more receptive to conserva mm -hmm. conservative ideas or uh, policies, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, when I think of this question, its biggest uh, kind of uh, reflection is policy. Mm -hmm. And so when even my liberal friends, they see the President uh, Biden kind of overreaching with mm -hmm. power and uh, either as mandates or executive mm -hmm. uh, action. And so they see that and they're moving more to the right a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I do think it's making them more receptive. And now, to what degree, if that even lasts, or yeah. to the degree that it's uh, doing a good job, is like, okay. I mean, we're only one year into the presidency, mm -hmm. so three more could totally change things. Mm -hmm. Either and, way. Yeah. It, it's surprising, I think, this question uh, made me think about how much either liberals or moderates actually really care about simple uh, economics like their grocery prices or gas prices. Well, that's because people vote with their wallets a lot of times, and that's what you see actually trickle down instead of these, mm. these big ideas that you can have... Um, about redistribution of wealth, but until you're actually feeling it in your own wallet and seeing mm. it in your taxes, you're not going to think about it as much. Yeah, and I, I feel for the the voter who who really cares about these uh, social aspects within the United States, mm. and they want to make a difference. But then their other side of them is like, wow, I do not want policies that make gas five dollars and yeah. when I go to fill my tank. I think well, that's because we're seeing both sides just get more and mm. more to the polls so that's you're going to leave a lot of Americans kind of stranded in the middle unsure of where to go but I think right now what we're seeing at least a lot of the spotlight is on the left moving more and more progressive at least in the establishment so then you're having those moderates and to, to the heart of this question the moderates and some of the liberals kind of question their alignment with the left mm -hmm. um, and I think I've seen that too and like you said moderates especially are a little bit more open to conservatism um, but I think that's more more on the elite and like Biden crowd mm -hmm. than the whole left in general perhaps um, I had a friend who he's like moderate, maybe liberal, um, and he said he would he wouldn't vote for Trump, but he would vote for DeSantis because mm. he doesn't like Biden anymore. Gotcha. So I think that's kind of I think showing. A lot of people represent that. Sentiment. Yeah, a lot of people are are unwilling to vote for Biden again, or um, they're not on his side anymore. But they would be mm. willing to look at someone a little more moderate yeah, or a little more. The irony there, because then the last election it was like, okay, it's people who are moderate, like I don't want Trump anymore, exactly. so I will go with Biden. And so they're just back and well, forth. Well, it's interesting because a lot of the choice for many Americans comes down to not who I like, but who I don't want. And so yeah, you're, you're voting thing. against someone instead of voting mm -hmm. for someone. For one specific uh, kind of example with this question of President Biden pushing people more rece receptive to conservatism is like the Keystone Pipeline. And we have mm -hmm. been we saw a video the other day about it. And so we had it passed under Trump. Mm -hmm. And the uh, thoroughness of the research done by the APA yeah. and any government uh, agency. Is it EPA? Or? Yeah, EPA. Okay. Uh, on the Keystone Pipeline was crazy that they said that multiple agencies said this is not going to be mm -hmm. a negative For years, starting in what, 2014 or earlier? Yeah, on the environment. And so to see that and then, okay, you have uh, President Trump pass that and then immediately Biden. Day one. Yeah, day one. Executive order. Get um, that out of there. And so I think that really is like, okay, yeah, the, the rational, I think, or just like the person who looks at straight mm -hmm. data or like facts is like, okay, wait, I don't understand if, if all these government agencies said that this project was completely clean, mm -hmm. it wasn't going to have like a net, uh, negative effect on the environment. So why did we just, is this just a political action? Yeah. Or is this like corruption or what is this, the yeah. motives behind this reasoning? Well, we saw, so 
like you mentioned, uh, Media Research Center had a Keystone Pipeline quick documentary. It was about 15 minutes. We saw it last night. Um, and it talked about how uh, President Obama vetoed it and then, mm. then Trump and then uh, Biden on the first day put, or put back a key permit. So then the Canadian company, I think, had to terminate the, the building of it. Mm. And we saw the human impact of it in that documentary as well, seeing people actually out in these towns whose livelihood were were dependent on the Keystone Pipeline and building it. Um, so that was another interesting facet of the whole Keystone, Keystone Pipeline story. Um, I think it also is an interesting time because what we're going to be seeing with the Russia sanctions is gas prices going up. And I think a key part of the Keystone Pipeline debate is just, um, and from the conservative point, is we're just seeing that the United States is going to be much more dependent on outside countries. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of being energy independent, we're going to have to be more globally connected. And I think that was probably, um, I'm assuming, part of the goal from the Biden administration is to make us more um, like we have to be in contact with other countries more because it's, I mean, the left is yeah. just more globalist by nature. Um, so I think that's probably part of it. Yeah, I... We'll have to talk about that another time, mm -hmm. uh, the last part. I definitely think that um, it, it's interesting to see, okay, like, if the reasoning behind canceling it is, is okay. We Either if it's, like, political or uh, behind the scenes or, like, common talk within uh, media or just online social media is that, well, we need to move towards renewable resources. And that's understandable. Like, okay, broad energy uh, kind of, like, plane or, or a box of what the United States can use, that's a good argument. But to totally cut off and become a net uh, importer instead of a net, net exporter, mm -hmm. we can see the economic effects. And it's not looking good right now. And then especially yeah. with the whole Russian uh, situation, it seems like this could have been avoided with uh, the gas prices. Yeah, well, the problem with the clean argument is that the research for years said that it would not have an, a negative impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. So either the science changed... Oh, no, I mean, I mean like, uh, resorting to either wind sources oh, okay, okay. or sun sources um, while also But isn't the goal of that to not have negative impact on the mm -hmm. environment? Correct. So if this research said the Keystone Pipeline wouldn't have it, mm -hmm. a negative impact, then that's kind of the same thing. Yeah, there's definitely holes within the reasoning, and it's really, it doesn't make sense from any kind of perspective that yeah. I've heard so far of, okay, I, that's what I mean. Like, I understand, like, moving towards broader energy sources or mm -hmm. clean, renewable resources, but to cut off this and to see the research that mm -hmm. it wouldn't have a negative impact is really interesting. Yeah, and that's definitely. the fact, we come back to the question that it's pushing uh, and making more people receptive to conservative kind of policies. Yeah, definitely. And I think especially on the economy mm -hmm. is what we're seeing um, with the gas prices and everything like that. But that, I mean, that's definitely not what true conservatism is no. and down th that's to. The that's the very another next question. survey yeah, question great. is that, I liked with this survey, I like pointing out misconceptions within what, okay, we believe and mm -hmm. know conservatism as. And the one question was, conservatism says that the economy is more important than the culture. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a common theme, I think, in just our lifetime that conservatism is hand-in-hand -hand, uh, thought of as, low okay, taxes. Ec yeah, low taxes yeah. and uh, small government. Yeah. And like, in a small uh, facet, it's like, yes, that is related to it, but that's not the driving principles or... Uh, the driving cause of uh, the conservative movement. Mm -hmm. And so I think in this instance, culture is on hand. I think more important, I think we've seen that in our lifetime, is that, okay, cultural impacts are going to have impacts on the economy. So I think it comes first in uh, policy decisions mm -hmm. or just uh, community decisions of how people uh, create their culture. And yeah. then the, the economy will kind of fall next. It's really interesting how, I know we've talked about it on the show before, but how conservatism often is now reduced to just simply low taxes, limited mm -hmm. government. Um, and I think that has to do so much with the libertarian strand that has kind of come into conservatism or what we now understand to be modern day conservatism. Okay. Um, because whenever you think about it, if I'm trying to get someone over to my side to be a conservative, I, it's easier, a lot easier to argue, hey, well, no one wants uh, high taxes, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want high taxes. I don't want high taxes. You're a conservative. But that's not what conservatism is. But it's a lot harder to say, hey, I do think um, gay marriage shouldn't be legal or something like that that is a more cultural issue 
that's a lot harder to argue to someone who maybe doesn't share um, Judeo-Christian values or something like that. So that, I think, is why we've seen it. It's a lot more palatable to the most people um, just because everyone can agree that they don't want to be paying high taxes. So that's why it's been reduced because it's so much e easier to argue. Yeah. I guess my understanding of, okay, when I talk about conservatism within culture and how that is important and focusing on the culture, I think, okay, well, like the book I'm reading right now, The Case for Civility, like there is a proponent of, okay, having civility with the other side and coming to common terms, um, but while still understanding that we will use our Judeo-Christian values and mm -hmm. morals to guide what we make decisions on and what we like will uh, make accommodations on yeah. or uh, come to the table with. So I don't know if I technically think like there's definitely a distinction between uh, between our religious ideas and our uh, freedom of conscience uh, decisions in politics, and I want there to be a distinction between church and state, right? But then there doesn't, that doesn't mean that one does not have an influence on the other, mm -hmm. or one cannot be, uh, one should Related. be excluded, that they mm -hmm. should not be uh, separate, but like within each other they work together. Yeah, because when you think about it, everyone has a set of values that guide them in life and that's just a worldview and religion is a worldview and mm -hmm. if you're not quote unquote religious you're still having a worldview guide you and if that's atheism that's still mm -hmm. basically a religion but man it's God so yeah, that's why I like it's thinking all ab religion about it as freedom of conscience because okay it's whatever your ethics or guiding principles are and even if that's nothing but majority of Americans are, are do, they do have uh, mm -hmm. guiding principles ethics morality in their life in their yeah. day to day relationships how they uh, work in the business place and so that's very loud yeah, sorry if, if you're hearing something, we're in the hotel lobby. Um, the only problem, I think, with talking about freedom of religion is freedom of conscience is then you think it's only the thought process. It, you only have the freedom to have those thoughts but not exercise it. And it, yeah. I guess, I mean, it's all related. Well, so I see, I see what you're saying. I think I the guess. basic understanding of freedom of religion is the right to exercise. And I think it's just that people have resorted it to only that and mm -hmm. they view it as um, either Christianity or Islam. Mm -hmm. um, or any other sect of kind of, okay, that is a religion. And yeah. they don't view their own, like, freedom of conscience at, or their active decisions as also a freedom to exercise what they want to do in life. Mm -hmm. And they kind of resort to, I think, in, in a civil uh, liberty way, ways when it's really uh, freedom of religion. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. And we'll have some more data on that as as we get more surveys mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the day. So Yeah, we'll be heading over to CPAC within the hour or two. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for listening to two episodes from sunny Orlando, Florida. It's been an awesome trip. And like I said, again, the student fellowship through the Institute of Faith and Freedom is an awesome opportunity for any listeners ten out of ten. <laughs> that go to Grove City to get involved in the conservative movement and get involved at Grove City College. So we, we thank you for listening today. Subscribe. Hit yes, the bell please hit down there two. somewhere. Yes. And Share we look forward to, to talking to you soon. Thanks, y'all. Bye. For more information on this podcast or other programs, please visit faithandfreedom.com.